It's the country's busiest motorway, yet few driving past the M25's Junction 22 will be aware that just a few hundred metres off the hard shoulder is the birthplace of a breakthrough that helped Britain win the war. In 1939, the then isolated Salisbury Hall was commandeered by the Air Ministry as the secret workshop to develop a new and innovative weapon of a kind that had never been seen before. Inside what looked like an innocuous barn, the plane took shape that would spearhead Bomber Command's assault on Germany. And here it is. You're looking at a hidden treasure of British military aviation history. This is de Havilland Mosquito No. 1, the prototype that was actually built here and first flew 75 years ago almost. It was created in great secrecy. This whole area of the workshops were disguised as farm buildings. It's a miracle that the prototype itself has actually survived because it was only hours away from being set light to. The factory saw no inherent value in saving an aircraft of which they built nearly 8,000. And they had made an outstanding contribution to victory. With its twin Merlin engines, Mosquito's power-to-weight ratio meant its bomber version flew missions unarmed. It was the highest and fastest thing in the air, operating beyond the range of enemy guns. That made it ideal for surprise raids, like this 1945 attack on German shipping in Norway. Enemy coast coming up. and the perfect pathfinder with the pinpoint aiming needed to drop marker flares that guided Lancasters and other heavy bombers onto their targets. With the Mosquito, you could fly high and fast. In the heavy bombers, you were sitting duck, really, and um, the thing was that um, we got in very quickly and we flew very high and very fast, and we were warned not to dive any faster than 500 miles an hour because the windscreen might come in, which is rather reassuring. <laughs> A very fine aircraft, obviously, as everyone knows, and uh, very enjoyable to fly. The main point against it was the terrible cold. It was bitterly cold, especially in the winter, and it was cramped. The poor old navigator had to sit on the dinghy and unfortunately the valve for the dinghy was uppermost. And so it was a joke that anybody that was a navigator in a mosquito never suffered from hemorrhoids. Initially, Germany had no response to an aircraft capable of over 400 miles an hour and which could attack from eight miles up or at treetop level. Visitors to the museum hear how the Luftwaffe's chief took that personally. Going was furious. He said, what's happening? The British have run out of aluminium, they've got the furniture industry making their bombers out of wooden aircraft, and you nincompoops don't even give me an aircraft that can bomb accurately over London. About 50 air crew survive. All remember the pride they felt to be selected for the RAF's elite. I was allocated to a bomber squadron, and we flew in Stirlings at Downham Market. And I always remember seeing the mosquitoes flying over and thinking how jealous I was of the crew who had flew in mosquitoes. When we got on the mosquito, we swank because we were the elite and we knew we were the cream. As the Germans fought tenaciously to defend their homeland, interceptors were developed to challenge the mosquito's supremacy. It could be intense and intimate combat. Fred Crawley awarded the DFC, who flew 45 ops, remembers hearing the chilling voice of the enemy in his headphones. The leader of the, of the squadron was educated in this country and would talk to you on your wavelength. And he would say, good evening, gentlemen, it's nice to see you. You're two minutes late tonight, you know, and all this sort of stuff. But he could see you because you were at the end of the contract. That, that must have been so frightening. All, all he could do would keep your head in down and hope for the best. Yeah, just about 80 minutes. But then, of course, once you had bobbed, marked, taken your picture to prove you were there and where you were there, um, then you got the hell out of it as fast as you could go. In their early 20s, they had to get used to the prospect of death on any sortie, and lives depended on how well pilot and navigator gelled. The main thing was that you got on well with your pilot. You could see those who were arguing all the time, they never came back. I feel very lucky. 
I don't think the good crew survived. I think it was the lucky crews that survived. Actually, we were so young, death didn't mean much to us in those days. And uh, we just carried on. We were doing our job for our country, regardless of whether we were killing people, which we were doing, of course, which is rather sad on reflection. We were, we were helping our country to win the war. So successful against Germany, several squadrons continued into the Cold War, protecting our skies against the Soviet threat until jet power took over. How did the Mosquito compare with flying a jet? I mean, did it seem as though you'd gone from a cart horse to a thoroughbred? Oh, there's no comparison. I mean, the Mosquito was a marvellous aeroplane, but uh, the jets were so superior in many ways. Well, the aircraft that they flew with such distinction and valour has been described as man's greatest engineering achievement in wood because that was the Mosquito's defining characteristic. It was built out of balsa and plywood, a radical idea for a warplane at that time. Jerry Mears is one of the engineering team here, restoring the prototype. Jerry, I can't imagine that the Air Ministry, when presented with the idea of a wooden warplane, thought, yes, we'll have some of those. No, certainly not, certainly not. Their reaction was more or less, there's the door. <laughs> so what happened? Um, there was a lot of work done by Geoffrey de Havilland with the Ministry, and he had a staunch supporter, Sir Wilfred Freeman. It got the name of Freeman's Folly eventually, but after negotiations, demonstrations and the like, he was allowed to build one, the prototype. And why wooden? Was it to do with metal shortages? Yes, aluminium was of course in great demand at the time for all the other aircraft. De Havilland was used to building wooden aircraft, like the Albatross, the forerunner, actually. So, and the carpenters and the cabinet makers at the time were not building furniture for the, um, for the home market. So they, they, they were basically out of a job. And we've got a picture here, let's have a look at that, which shows uh, how right they were to use wood. I mean, the, the survivability of the construction. What, what are we looking exactly. at? Exactly. We're, we're looking at the um, starboard wing, which has been shot away or maybe collided with perhaps a chimney pot <laughs> when they're low-flying... Um, sorties. It was not unusual for mosquitoes to come back in that sort of condition. They'd even prepared repairs for the wings where they would cut them off along this uh, frame and slot a new, whole new outer section in. And I think you've got a section that shows us the, the technique that, that was used. So uh, d describe for me how this, you know, the, the, the techniques of the furniture factory took to the air. Yes, this is a section from the fuselage, and it's a composite structure. It has a layer of birch ply on the outside, a sandwich filler of balsa wood, and then another layer of birch ply on the inside, bonded together. And then it's covered eventually with Irish linen, such as this, which forms a completely waterproof protective surface all over. Let's talk about the, the prototype, Jerry. Um, what are we seeing here today? What work is being done ready for the anniversary? What are you trying to do? We have completely um, renovated it. We dismantled it, took the fuselage away from the wings, stripped all of the Irish linen off the uh, covering off it, examined the wood underneath, and repaired any little bits and pieces, what we call hanger rash. Um, it was then recovered with Irish linen, painted, and put back together. And the question you must get asked, I'm sorry, a hundred times a week, will it fly? <laughs> yes, we are asked that question every day. And if I had a pound for every time it was asked, we could go and buy a new one. Of course, it will never fly. It's far too valuable. It's a prototype. It's the only surviving World War II prototype anywhere in the world. Well, the focus today has been on this, the Mosquito, because it's such an iconic aircraft approaching its anniversary. It's very much the jewel in the crown of this collection. We should remember it is the de Havilland collection, and that famous company made some great aircraft, part of Britain's military and civil aviation heritage. Well, I'm joined by Mike Nevin, who's a trustee of the collection. Uh, Mike, what about these other aircraft standing out, looking rather forlorn in the rain? Are they the forgotten children? Well, they're far from forgotten. I mean, the, the Havilland Aircraft Museum is a unique museum. It's the only one dedicated to one manufacturer of aircraft, de Havilland. And that's not just the iconic mosquitoes, of which we have three. 
Uh, no other museum has three of those, and they're here in this museum. Outside, in the rain today, we have the Comet 1A. It's the only surviving example of a um, comet, the first jet airliner that flew, and uh, we're in the business of restoring that. And we also have uh, the Dove and two vampires uh, just basking in the wet weather we have today. Now, the important thing about those aircraft is that they've got to get undercover. And one of the things we're trying to do here is m increase the, sp the actual cover for these aircraft in um, a new hangar. And that hangar is going to cost us one and a half million pounds. And when we've finished it, uh, and we need every penny that anybody's got, uh, we're going to put the Comet in, in the hangar and we're going to put other aircraft in there as well. Flaps clear, air on. Although at its wartime peak, de Havilland's had 138,000 people on the payroll, today the firm's long gone and few still have the skills needed to maintain the wooden wonder. Yet those who had the closest connection with World War II's most versatile aircraft have once more rallied to its defence. Far less mobile than when they were the cream of Bomber Command, today they've made their way to the museum to sign limited edition prints recreating its maiden flight. They'll be sold to help preserve the memory of a unique aircraft and the men who made history.